Hi, I'm Bryman Williams and we are back with the small print and today my guest is Tracy Follows who is a good Twitter friend of mine but as always I would like Tracy to start by please introducing yourself the way you would like to be introduced. Oh hi Bryman, it's lovely to be here at last. Um, gosh I don't think it's very complicated, I'm Tracy Follows and I work as a futurist. Fantastic and I invited you here today to talk about your book which I actually finally managed to get an actual copy of all the way here in South Africa, despite our, our very delayed postal service. But the book is a really powerful piece of work, I think, because it cuts across not just technology, but also the psychology behind technology. And more importantly than that, the philosophy of what technology is doing to us and our societies, but not just our societies, also to us as individuals. Do you maybe want to just explain in a few words how you would describe your own book and what you were trying to get across with it? Sure, of course. Um, and thank you for all the support for it. I know you did a, a great review for it. Thank you, um, early days. Um, and you were obviously one of the people I, I spoke to. I spoke to many people as I was researching it. Um, I think it, it started off in about 2016 when I started to think about and notice more the fragmentation of our identities and as you know the first bit of the book before we really even get into the chapters properly is about the distributed you which I think is the phenomenon um, for um, most of our identities um, in the digital world now. I suppose I started to notice that our identity was fracturing, it was fragmented, how are we going to keep it together and there's an awful lot of work out there about privacy but I really wanted to write something about identity and specifically autonomy around our identity because I felt like there were, well, the machines are reading us and the machines are making kind of um, assumptions, shall we say, <laughs> about uh, who we are. Um, and so, I mean, there's plenty of um, anecdotes and stories um, about that. But as the book went on and I was researching it and writing it, in the first lockdown, of course, the whole <laughs> the whole idea of identity really came home. And because we were all locked down, I think the theme of the book in particular became about the power or presence or preservation of our identity in a world of increased collect collectivity, if you like. So, um, all I was seeing everywhere at the time was, you know, we this and we that. And whilst obviously I support the whole notion and idea of community, <laughs> the whole idea of collectivism um, and its assumed benefits, I felt was kind of overriding um, any autonomy we had as individuals. So I guess that's really the foundation of the book. And then, as you know, we kind of explore, I explore of various aspects of how our identity is changing but I really did think particularly during like 2020 really kind of thought is there only ever going to be now the future of we not the future of me and the future of you and that's what was really at the back of my mind through um through writing it and I think that's that's been borne out and we can you know talk about where that might go in the future but yeah that's my that's my worry and my concern, really. So I was trying in a very small way <laughs> to a very small way uh, to redress the balance, really. Mm. I want to pick up right there because I think there's an interesting dichotomy that arises after you've read through your work and read between the lines and listened to what you've said now, which, which you weren't so explicit about in the book. You, you took quite, a, quite an objective opinion, which I think makes the book quite valuable to anyone. You're not coming through there with any trying to sell any particular agenda or idea of the future. But it did really strike me that at the same time that us as individuals, as human beings, as whether we have free will or not, but as individual entities are becoming more collectivized in the real world or in society, you're also talking about how our individual identities are becoming fragmented. So like the I is becoming a we, but the we is also becoming an I, which is, which is quite interesting. So it's almost these equal and opposite trends, which do tend to play out if anyone works in the future space. You do know that as soon as you've got an action here, it tends to drive a reaction somewhere else. So how would you go about reconciling those two ideas of the fragmentation of the eye, but also the cohesion of the various eyes into quite a homogenous sort of group 
of non-human almost entities. Yeah, that's really interesting because I suppose one has to think about the scale of we. Um, and I think what I'm um, kind of trying to bat against is like, the overwhelming nature of it, like a global we, like the homogeneity on a mass scale. And actually the we in a more local um, sort of human level is, is perfectly understandable. And we've done it for thousands and millions of years. Um, and so that we know that works, but I kind of feel like there, there are these forces, <laughs> let's just say that there are these forces that are driving us towards a sort of global way. It's funny you asked me this question actually, because I was just literally last night looking at, um, I was looking at an issue of the philosopher actually, um, and it is called, what is we? Um, and there's a beautiful bit at the beginning that says, I'm just gonna read this to you because you, I think you'll appreciate this and like this. Um, what is we? According to the Oxford English Dictionary, we is the subjective case of the first person plural pronoun. Of course, it is a pronoun used indefinitely in general statements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then it goes on: um, his or her contemporaries, compatriots, fellow human beings, etc. We is an epistemology. We is an assumption of shared subjectivity, perspective, or experience. We is an invitation to affiliate. I'm down with all of that. But then quite interestingly, he says, we is a promise and a threat. As the feminist theorist Robin Wigman writes, we is a towering inferno of universalism, a monstrous display of self-infatuation, an error, an excess that we can nevertheless not want, a tantalizing hallucination we cannot help but desire. We is what we write towards. Equally, we is what we must never reach. Isn't that incredible? That's really incredible. It really does speak to everything that you're trying to get out there. I don't know. Where, where did you find that? <laughs> I, I know. I tell you what, I, I'll, I'll send you a copy. Like, this is the philosopher. It's just it's brilliant. Everyone should subscribe. Um, but I thought that was, and that's just like the first page of the entire um, uh, edition of that journal. But the point they're making is that obviously I and we are incredibly uh, interlinked. We cannot even sort of perceive or speak about we without referencing the I. <laughs> and equally, I suppose we can't really build uh, I, the identity, without, of course, reference to, you know, the tribe or the community that we're in. And I think, you know, I talk about that a little bit in the book where, you know, identity to some degree is not something we get to choose and mould and shape ourselves. It's really half the time conferred on us by the tribe or the group to which we'd want to belong or think we belong. Um, so of course there are these interdependencies and it's really incredibly difficult to <laughs> untangle them. Um, but I think what I'm kind of saying is the overall narrative, certainly the one which we hear through the airwaves of the uh, mainstream media, mostly you know TV media, but also kind of press and lit literary media is very much, you know, we is good, and I is bad. And that's, that's, you know, we've spent a fair few decades around pushing the ideas of individualism and self-expression, all of that. And it feels to me like literally over the last five years, perhaps since about 2015, 16, there's a flip. And actually now it's all about, we have to put we first and I is very much second. And I just don't know how we're gonna survive if that's the case, because um, I was always, I was always taught that we put on our own oxygen mask before we help others, but apparently now we, we have to help others to the detriment of ourselves. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this massive shift towards the greater good rather than the individual good and the sort of flattening of ethics to very utilitarian terms, right? Because yeah. utilitarianism is exactly that. I mean, the individual has to give way to the greater good if you start sort of counting beans as to, mm -hmm. to try and make morality into numbers which I think reflects of society at large, because anything that we do digitally, whether it's a conversation like this, whether it's a piece of digital art, whatever it is, digital by definition is discrete. And what is discrete? It is a flattening of a continuous reality. So it's going to be simplified in some way. So I think it makes sense that we're trying to simplify our ethics and our societies the same way we've simplified our communications and our lives. So it's, there seems to be this understanding that we can replace, you know, messy humanity and messy real life with nice, clean numbers, which can be managed. But the only way to do that is to give up a lot of our individuality. 
because individuals are messy. They don't fit neatly into, into grids. You can't, you can't work out who fits where in society because we are so complex. And you know, ultimately, intersectionality kind of boils down to an intersection of one, because no one else has, to use the language, your unique lived experience. And that's not, that's not comfortable. That's very, very messy. So we prefer to flatten it, bring it down to simple numbers, and then manage people's groups instead of individuals. And it's almost the only way to organize a society where it gets to a certain size and scale. So there's no room for an individual in a really massive society. It's just too complicated to relate to individual citizens on an individual basis. At some point, you kind of have to simplify those terms. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I do. you've made a very profound point. I'm going to make a very vacuous one in response, which is um, that... Um, only the other day, I was looking at the changes that some of the biggest luxury brands have made to their um, logos and their brand identity. I mean, you all know this as well. But yeah. And so I was looking at oh, like Yves Saint Laurent, Bauman, all these beautiful logos with like signatures and, um, you know, character. Obviously, they didn't mean anything when they were created and they've been um, embedded with meaning through their behaviours and experiences that people have had. And now you look at where, all, I mean, there were about 20 different really distinctive um, logos that have a real presence and very defined identity. All of them had kind of dropped their signatures and they were all sans serif. They were all quite bold and condensed and blah, 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 they went down the list and they all look pretty much the same. And that is because they all want a presence in the digital environment. And of course, a very bold sans serif, characterless look or identity they think stands out because it only stands out when um, <laughs> everybody's different and now of course everyone's the same because everybody's followed the same path and I was thinking in this vacuous example I was thinking but that's just us that's the way in which we have kind of shifted and translated ourselves into some of these sort of digital environments and you know that's not necessarily a, a good thing and no wonder we're all sort of um, well many of us are sort of going a little bit mad and um, overcompensating um, with uh, newfangled uh, ways in which to, um, you know, create and express the complexity of our own identity, when actually we all exist as these sans serif identities now in a digital environment. So I do agree with what you just said about, you know, it flattens the, the character, I think. And so one has to find new ways to create complexity and interest around one's character and sometimes that's for the good and sometimes it's for the bad right <laughs> yeah exactly it's about taking up all the edges very literally like you talk about taking off all the serifs and <laughs> just flattening yeah. it but to stick with that sort of graphic design point i think everyone listening to this will know the current sort of illustration aesthetic of websites at the moment which tend to be very flat, very 2D, very color blocked images of always faceless human beings okay, so at the there's moment. No there's no face. They're taken literally it. the face away. <laughs> so it's, a, it's, a, it's part of the same sort of trend. But I think that that's what you were getting at there, that people start to rebel against that. So at the same time that we are being flattened as individuals to try and fit into a digital world that wants to manage us digitally, the only way for a company or a country to manage a citizen or employee digitally is by flattening off their edges and making sure that they can fit into the digital cogs and gears. They have to be made discreet in order to do that. So at the same time, the individual is being flattened and sort of forced to become a human resource rather than a human being, become part of the group to give up a whole lot of individual choice and privileges for more greater good choices. You've also got then a sort of a rebellion of the individual that is not able to remain apart from the we in his or her real life. They then try and reclaim the we by turning themselves into a fractured we. So you spoke a bit earlier about sort of fragmenting our identity in the, in the online space. But we also starting to see this come out through sort of TikTok communities, which I've been following from sort of youth culture trends work that I do. And there's this emergence of, obviously, we all know about everyone trying to explore their own identity, use things like neo pronouns. These are all ways to sort of claw back a bit of individuality and a bit of identity. But the latest sort of shift we're seeing is this claiming of multiple personalities or like internal tulpas 
that young people are trying to develop to literally split their personality, not seeing that as a mental disorder, but seeing that as a, a way to empower themselves, which I think is quite extraordinary. So building a split internal personality, not just a split digital identity. It's a sort of schizophrenic existence. So if we can't be an individual apart from the herd or the group, we can turn ourselves into a we, which is, I think, quite an extraordinary idea. What are your comments on this fragmenting of our own identities as a response to a very homogenization of society outside yeah. of ourselves? So I agree, it is a response to that, and it is about feeling empowered, but it's also about empowering oneself to have control over others who don't understand it. So this whole thing of split personalities and many, many kinds of identities and the complexity, I'm so interesting, I'm such an interesting person, look at the complexity, um, is definitely a fluid thing as well. So you never really know when the one part is going to show up or quite how it's going to manifest. So that's a bit um, disorientating for anybody else you're engaging with. Um, and of course, you can slap them down if they, you know, use the wrong pronoun or refer to you in the wrong way or catch you in the wrong mood. And it's very much a sort of sense of control over the environment and the other people that you're conversing with. Um, I think that's been coming for quite a long time. And I've spoken to people about that like years ago, about the ways in which because there is a, a generation or more than one generation now, actually, um, who are unable to get an economic foothold and therefore a foothold in democracy and governance of perhaps their wider community, the nation, let's say, which is an interesting kind of idea of scale for, for we, um, which has come under some threats, shall we say, of, of late. Um, they tried to get a foothold and a sense of status in other ways. And of course, social media has um, is a great canvas for that. And that's got kind of wildly out of control now because you, can, you just push it and push it and push it further. And what you end up getting, as you well know, is a complete disconnect between you know, what's happening in the real world where they can't quite get a foothold through no sort of fault of their own, through the fault of you know, the older generations and MPs and politicians and everything, but they can get a foothold in this and it's quite addictive and it gives one a control in a very social space where one can exert one's own media through the playfulness, or one might say the mischievousness, of uh, these complex ide identities that one can um, create. Um, and it's kind of interesting because one can think that social media is just a, a way of expressing oneself, but it's not really. In the end, it becomes a reflection, you know, and I really, I think somebody should definitely do, I'd love to do this, I bet you would too, a dissertation on the whole idea of the, of the mirror, you know, the whole, the whole idea that it's social media or the glass on your smartphone is literally that mirror and it's reflecting back to you how you'd like to be seen but of course it's not necessarily how you are seen and how those two things kind of need to need to resolve themselves for people to feel more happy <laughs> and content but of course they never will resolve themselves because that's the whole that's the whole game that you're kind of playing with other people so um yeah I mean when it comes to the split identity thing, it's fascinating to me, and it is a really fundamental question throughout the book, I suppose, but particularly when I'm talking about virtual reality or some of these other spaces. Um, even like when um, you look at Julie Carpenter's work around the military using robots and you know, the relationships that we have in and around technology and in and around immersive media, you know, what is, an alternative identity and what is just an extension of your physical identity. I just think it's very, very difficult to kind of determine that at the moment. And it does become important because there are those questions around the fact that your identity in some of these environments is, is made up of data. And so who does that data belong to? And you know, as well as I did, that there's that famous case, Riley versus California where you know, a judge is being asked to work out, is the smartphone and the data on it the property of you or is it actually you? <laughs> is it an extension of you? Um, and at the moment, I think we're in the realms of the latter. 
but that to me is absolutely fascinating because it has so many implications for you know where we go into the virtual world who controls that data these alternative identities and representations that we're making of ourselves that we don't necessarily see as extensions of ourselves we see as alternative selves maybe to some degree certainly when we're behaving in different ways to how we would in the real world in virtual games or whatever but they really are extensions of ourself and so how do you kind of bring it back all in to sort of manage and take control of it or do you kind of just let it go and say well the decentralized system if you like i know you're a fan of that at the minute um, <laughs> the decentralized system will take care of it you know um, I don't. I just don't think enough people are thinking about it because I think we have just assumed that. Oh well, it's just one big community. It's just one big sort of we, um, and nobody's really thinking about the effects massively on back on the individual. I love what you're saying about the mirrors there because it does reflect and come back to us. But again, it's coming back to us in an ever more flattened way right so you see you're looking into a mirror that is diminishing rather than reflecting everything back of you because it's a digital mirror and then you're responding to that and with every sort of iteration you become a more flattened more caricaturized version of yourself and in a very sort of tangible way too the, the filters that we use right and like when we use selfies and we put a, a filter on that filters out our wrinkles and flattens our face and that gets reflect, reflected back to us and we become thinner and thinner and thinner in terms of our, <laughs> our actual personality. We become forced to become a sort of caricature that fits in to a system that sits on a particular point in a political spectrum and all the rest of it there. But I also wanted to pick up on what you were saying with the, the different identities. And I think there's two different ways to look at our sort of very divergent, diverse online identities that all of us curate and create for ourselves. The one is the way we develop alter egos, where we're creating different personas that we can try on for different occasions, almost different sorts of avatars in a more sort of tangible level, but also different personalities that we'll take with us and try on and use in certain social contexts on so certain social media platforms. So we have this identity for this person and that identity for another person. That's the one way to look at it. But the other way to look at it is a more sort of deliberate splitting up of our identity, almost as a form of resistance against sort of surveillance or as against impingements on our freedom and ability to transact. So a very deliberate withholding. So rather than a replacement identity that we can try on that might be make, make us feel more like our real selves, rather a deceptive identity or a diminished identity where we put it into different buckets and only allow certain eyes to see certain parts of ourselves. So the one is about cutting ourselves up and the other one is about sort of trying on different almost outfits. So actually being someone we're not. So I mean, another way to put it is the one is creating false identities that don't exist, imaginary versions of ourselves. And the other one is cutting up our real self you know, actually breaking that apart into various different pieces that again have to be put together at some point in time. And I think that's almost an illusion there because none of those are real. That sort of breaking up of who we are is can be seen as sort of hiding our hoard in different sort of holes in the ground, if you want to use that sort of metaphor to sort of break up and diversify our risk. And the, the trying on of these false identities too can just lead to quite a schizophrenic existence how do we bring those parts of ourselves back together again and will we be forced to do that at some point what are your thoughts on that fragmenting and sort of rebuilding of ourselves yeah I mean well that's one of the fundamental issues that I think I can't kind of sit here and solve it or um, kind of answer it because that is exactly the conundrum um, and there's this I mean the finsters and the rinsters you know, who is the real self, actually? It's no wonder I keep getting them mixed up because I find it really difficult um, to re almost remember. Though, hang oh, so yes, the one in which you're crying and showing us your real emotions is the fake one. Got it. I mean, I think that just kind of like, says it all, right? Um, but there's this, um, this emergence, re-emergence of the pseudonymous identity, of course, which is fascinating and as you and I have, have talked before I suppose um, about a lot of it is almost a safeguarding of one's core 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 identity because one is 
um, worried about how embattled that will become if it goes out and tells you its real opinions. So one has to kind of camouflage, I'd say. It's, it's kind of like putting on a camouflage. It's still you, it's not a different identity, but one has to put on one's, you know, <laughs> camouflage to uh, venture out into the jungle if one really wants to express one's own real authentic opinion. It's just too dangerous. I mean, that says a lot about our kind of supposed civilization right now. Um, but I guess I wonder how long term that is really going to be because with the technology the way it is, even just writing, your tone of voice still comes through. There are elements of your own identity which will still seep through the camouflage. And I think there will be tools that can kind of work out, oh, yes, this is you, isn't it? And then what, what is what I'm going to say when one, you know? Um, so <laughs> there obviously have been famous bloggers who've been blogging out there about, you know, COVID or about um, a technology. And I guess you'd call them whistleblowers to some extent. And once those are really uncovered, you know, it's a really horrendous um, day at the office for them. Um, but I think in the future, it's going to be just so difficult um, to go undercover like this and have a pseudonymous identity. I imagine it's quite liberating. I mean, I'm saying this to you, for all I know, you might have a pseudonymous identity and you're one of the blogs that I read, <laughs> I'm reading all the time. I just don't, we just don't know. It's a mystery. Um, but again, um, I think, unfortunately, technology is going to kind of puncture that mystery probably once again and um, and kind of not allow. It's almost like there's nowhere to hide. It's weird because we are creating all of these avatars and our wardrobe of avatars and um, turning up at different meetings with different avatars or different sort of social occasions online or we're going into virtual worlds and creating these personas and doing things that we'd never do in the real world because the expectations of us of how to behave have been, you know, have seeped in <laughs> for many years. Um, but at the same time, I, I don't think there is anywhere to hide or there won't be in the future because we will be monitored and analysed um, and sort of unpicked by forensic, digital forensic tools. And so where, where will we, where can we hide? This is, this is what's concerning me, I think. I feel like it's... Um, it's so all pervasive or it certainly will be in the future. I really don't see where is the place for somebody to just be themselves. Not that the book's about authenticity of identity. It's more about the integrity of identity for all the issues that we're talking about. But I kind of wonder, you know, where will be the where will be the place where one can really just be oneself? I'm concerned that there just probably won't be anywhere. <laughs> That's exactly the point. I think that we do tend to agree in, to a certain extent that the promise of the self-sovereign digital identity has a couple of quite big flaws in it. The first one would be let's even assume that it is possible to create a truly pseudonymous identity on the internet. The challenge then is that you know, so much of our lives are based on reputation, whether it is literal lines of credit or social credit or just the relationships that we have. By splitting those personality tied resources and reputational resources across multiple identities, you're creating so much more work for yourself. You have to build up those networks separately. You can't port one identity's sort of, you know, credits towards another, which means that by diversifying risk, you also greatly diminish the reward for each of those entities. It's much easier to build one life and one career than it is to build three or four lives and three or four careers. So there's a sort of practicality point of trying to split out social and financial credit across multiple identities, it's hugely exhausting and it's just not very practical for many, many people. Then, of course, there's the challenge with whether that's even possible or not, that there are ways and means to connect those various digital identities back together with each other, even on the pseudonymous blockchain-based self-sovereign sort of world, everything digital has a crumb, has a fingerprint. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it's, it's just a, Everything it's traceable. traceable. Everything digital is traceable, no matter sort of what you want to believe in that regard. But I think the biggest issue with it is that the most important privileges and rights in our real lives, you know, the ones that are essential for us actually still being alive, relate to our physical bodies. That's the right to be able to eat, the, the ability to transact, the ability to get healthcare. 
they require your physical presence in order to consume that food, in order to sleep in that bed, in order to live and own or rent that particular house. And that means that your digital identity at some point, whichever one you choose, whether it's your fragmented one that you or pseudonymous one you're using or your real one, is tied to your physical body. And does it really matter that you've been able to set up a pseudonymous life, assuming that's even possible, if you're not able to get your physical body through a door of a hotel or into a club or to purchase food or to get healthcare because whatever reason that identity doesn't contain the right credits? I think that a lot of people that work in this self-sovereign sort of identity space that were quite convinced they could have a completely self-sovereign identity had a quite a large awakening this year when things like vaccine passports rolled out and it's like no one cares about your pseudonymous identities credentials if you actually can't physically go into your office and collect your paycheck because your credits aren't attached to your physical body and I think that that's where people like you and me that tend to think about the future do get a little bit depressed about these ideas of identity you because <laughs> As digital sort of as our digital identities become more and more closely connected with our bodies, whether it's through sort of biosurveillance type of vaccine passport apps, whether it's through a national health insurance identity that's also tied to your banking credentials, whatever it is, it seems like the world of digital is coming in sort of enroaching more and more into the physical realm through the Internet of Things, through all these wonderful things like smart pools and the rest of it. It just doesn't seem that it's even possible to almost resist these things at this point because the temptations, the potential rewards, the greater good for general society that comes from greater surveillance and control just pushes society at large further and further away from freedom and more and more towards security whether that's financial security or physical security, it's very hard to argue against that. I live in obviously quite a crime-ridden society with one of the highest murder rates in the world. How do you object against facial recognition in the streets that could stop a woman or a small child from being murdered? How can you in good conscience resist that? But when you do, freedom is a tragedy of the commons. There's always a reason to remove some of that. Same with identity. There's always a reason to give up some privacy if, when viewed from a greater good utilitarian perspective. There is only a collective we, like you were speaking about earlier, reason to preserve that commons. And that's the, that's the great irony. There's always a special interest group that can take some of that away, but there's no special interest group that is sort of <laughs> fighting for the, for the the communal good of privacy and of increasing these sort of basic freedoms over our ability to move and transact, et cetera. I don't know if you'd agree with that, but it's, it's hard to find an optimistic viewpoint when you start thinking this through and through the incentives involved and the stakes involved and how our fear and envy and just general human nature play into the, the gradual, as you say, erosion of the, the individual's rights in a society that is becoming more and more geared towards the greater good Oof. well yes Sorry. <laughs> no 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 I, no exactly articulated perfectly um but you kind of left me with a and, and so what Tracy and I'm like well um <laughs> um this is perhaps the only thing that I can say which is perhaps we could perhaps we can preserve the amount of freedom that we have now or certainly stop the erosion of fur further freedoms or maybe even all we can do is slow it down I don't, I don't really know but obviously we've all seen the acceleration towards a kind of surveillance society and all the things you've just expressed brilliantly there um during during the pandemic um and I just think the more and more we give away during the pandemic um, it will never ever get that back. I mean, we're just never going to get these liberties back. It'll be literally impossible. Perhaps the biggest switcheroo I think that I've noticed and you I'm sure have noticed, um, but I don't think it has dawned on that many people in this way is that we used to travel like into the internet, into these digital worlds and people still talk about that when they 
when they talk about oh god i wasn't going to say the word metaverse but i just said it um when the people travel into the metaverse um but now what's happening is it's inside you you know the internet and digital is travel in inside you you will never get it out again that's my concern and once somebody has implanted it in you rather than giving you the opportunity to visit these digital realms like it's not under your control anymore and i think one of the things i was expressing or trying to express in the book is that we've always had the psychology of the self and the biology of the self and for many years obviously we've you know the, the kite cartesian world of is it the mind or is it the body um where does identity reside and what i'm saying is the psychology of the self and the biology of self has now been joined by the technology of the self and almost nobody has noticed uh, we're still thinking of technology as a tool that's in marshall McLuhan's words i suppose an extension to man but it, it is an extension to man but it's now an internal extension and we don't seem to have, and we won't have any control over that in the future. We will have signed up to terms of service, terms of service in the way that we have signed up to scroll around on the internet on people's photos. But it's a lot damn more serious when, you know, suddenly something that is in some senses in the future life-giving in some way or essential, you know, can be turned off if you don't behave in a certain way. And whilst I was researching the book and I was reading the World Economic Forum's Internet of Bodies, I'm not kidding you, I, mean, I kind of already knew it, but when I saw it written down in black and white, it was truly terrifying because it is exactly as you've just said, this argument for the greater good that we should all create these biobanks and all of this data has to be given over, not for our well-being, uh, but for the good of humanity. You know, a humanity that many of these people would argue that is absolutely hated by these sorts of organisations. And so it's very difficult to sort of twist it on its head and sort of say, oh, ha hang on a minute. <laughs> well, it's my personal data, or it's my biology, or it's my body. And we've seen it, as you rightly point out, with um, vaccination passports. And I think, you know, there are things happening in the background that are just not being noticed. And maybe all we can do is flag these up and notice them and encourage other people to flag them up and also notice them so that we can preserve at least the amount of uh, freedom or autonomy over our individual identities uh, that we have now, knowing that what we've lost can't really be regained, um, but also knowing that what we've potentially could lose in the future definitely definitely will never be regained and there are I mean just one example is this health security agency that the then um, health secretary set up in the UK um, I think it was last I, I can't even I can't even remember what happened when but I think it was um, in April this year April 21 um, and this whole idea of we were, I can't remember the words exactly, but they're really quite frightening in that we will use digital technologies basically to get the public to, to behave the way we want them to. And we all recognize that that's happened in the last sort of 18 months, but to see it in black and white underneath a health security agency, I really feel is, is terrifying. But, you know, to lots of people, it's just like, yeah, well, we, you know, you would, wouldn't you? It's, it's safety, is it? We've got to look after people. Um, it's, it's not about putting yourself first, Tracy. Um, and I, what, life, life. what kind of a monster are you? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, absolutely. I mean, I'm just like, oh, please, can you not see what's, what's happening? But he uses words like we can engage with the citizens to encourage them to, you know, it's the whole nudge thing on steroids. Um, but one understands from reading it that there can be literally any excuse for this, you know, health security to be put into, into force and to, um, to bludgeon people really to behave in certain ways. Now, when the internet or digital is part of yourself rather than a place you visit, then you have lost control of that um, and you're not an autonomous individual anymore. Fabi, so uh, it is one of my more, <laughs> my more my more controversial opinions is that the emergence of national health care is actually basically the end of bodily autonomy. Because yeah. when someone else, when the greater community is literally paying 
for your medical bills, they have a right over that body. There's quite a big difference between national medical insurance and a social welfare net that's purely physical. Because of course, if your society is responsible for your physical choices, there are still limits to how much of your personal choices that society should have a say over. Sure, if you do belong to a society where there are wonderful, lovely welfare entitlements, you're going to give up some of your physical security in the form of paying more taxes and agreeing to certain different terms and tariffs of collecting that welfare when you find yourself on the less fortunate side of the spectrum. But when it comes to national health insurance, there are essentially no limits no even ethical limits, and this is where it gets really, really tricky, to society putting limits on your physical freedom. If society is going to pay for your heart bypass when you're 58 years old, society should have you know, a say on how many burgers you get to eat each day. If society is going to pay for your asthma, society should could, you know, legitimately be argued but, that they should have a say over how much carbon you are yeah, but then, consuming but then not during your everybody. life, right? Yeah, but then not everybody funds it, do they? Not everyone in society funds it, and actually some people fund it a lot more. So should they have more say? Should they have That's more That's the slippery slope. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. So, so essentially, you know, a generation ago, we signed away our physical and physical autonomy, and now the bill is coming due. You know, when the easy money dries up, suddenly the people paying the bills are going to ask these hard questions. And this is where you're going to get told, you know, you can't actually belong and be part of a society that where you have all of these entitlements if you're not actually prepared to submit to various degrees of surveillance. At the moment, that surveillance can be as simple as sort of personal carbon credit scores and, you know, vaccine passports. These are all ways for society to balance the risk and reward equation. And they are perfectly legitimate and even ethically arguable based on the societies and this that we signed up for, the sort of bargain that we've agreed to in a society that preferences physical and physical security over physical and physical freedom. The sad part, however, is that we haven't left any opportunities for individuals to opt out. It's sort of either an all or nothing kind of a bargain that we sort of coming to understand now. Quite soon it will be, you know, it, it, it will be unconscionable to refuse more invasive degrees of medical surveillance already. I mean, I know you've also got the vitality program there in the UK that's sort of linked to your health benefits. You know, you won't be able to opt out of not going for doing certain amounts of exercise every day, watching your calorific intake and all the rest of it, because there's a legitimate claim on society on the other side to that individual conforming to the rules that everybody else is playing by, because everybody else is you know, supporting or funding the, the fallouts if you don't support those rules. And then, as you say, it's not a huge hop, skip and a jump towards asking people to, you know, you know, wear in skin monitors or to wear sort of Fitbits or whatever that's the track that you are playing by the rules because if everyone else is playing by the rules, so should you. And then from there, you know, from sort of wearables to ingestibles is as we know quite a quite a small gap again. So yeah, that's well, the sort of soon, that, that's the cycle we're going down. <laughs> well, very soon people will be asked to take vaccines against cancer based on their particular, you know genomic reader or their DNA or whatever because it's for the good of the National Health Service that we wouldn't want at some point in the future us to become a, an over, over, overly become a burden on the NHS and so if we know that's our DNA um, and we know that something's hereditary or, or whatever it might be um, then what, when, then we absolutely should take that vaccination and there'll be a whole group of people ready to kind of you know support that with their you know placards saying oh, yes you should you should behave like that but one of the more more worrying even more worrying than that possibly is I mean these things always happen after the war uh, a war yeah. when one can has set the table for these things to um, happen and people feel vulnerable and they feel like it's part of the solution to get out of the bad situation. And that's what, I guess, that's what happened, you know, quite rightly with the NHS, whatever, although it's kind of morphed into <laughs> something else now. If, yeah. as many of us have heard this referred to as a war, this um, COVID-19 pandemic, as we come out of this, I worry that the same thing's gonna happen with mental health as happened with physical health with the NHS. There's a lot of talk about mental health all the time. So, okay, um, what about our thoughts then um, versus our actions with bodily autonomy or not? What about our thoughts with our own sort of mental 
cognitive autonomy or not. You know, very soon you could be in a situation where you know you can't have those thoughts. It's for the good of the the whole. It's for the collective good that you shouldn't have those thoughts. You shouldn't be even be thinking that because you know, kind of like even if you're right about it, it's not doing anyone any good, is it, to have those thoughts? And I just wonder. There's this this kind of um, I don't know what you, you you call it, but this this obsession <laughs> over mental health, um, and and it's a, a wide ranging canvas of mental health uh, from real trauma to sort of microaggressions. Um, I just I just wonder if we're going to get a sort of um, parallel situation where we come out of this war and we need to create something that looks after our mental health in a way that frankly, I don't want to be necessarily part of, but we'll form something that's for the greater good. And as you know, if we move forward and we have um, sort of brain to brain connectivity, or we have thought control that's under the manipulation or under the, under the management of um, tech platforms, whatever those might be in the future, whether they are Neuralink or, or anything else, you know, we're, again, we're going to completely and utterly lose control of that. Um, well, I kind of hope that's what the new Matrix 4 is going to be like. I mean, what could it possibly, you know, I don't know. If it's not, if it's not going to be a rehash of Ma the Matrix 1, the original, then I'd like it to be about that so that we can at least get some sort of blueprint to the future. <laughs> Hopefully, hopefully. But what you point out there is that when we redefine harm as hurt feelings or as sad feelings, then, of course, we link it very closely towards the healthcare conversation again around mental health. And I think the, the sort of starting points we'll start to see there that we're already seeing is increased censorship that could cause mental harm. Censorship, not just in what terms of what you're allowed to say, but also as what you're alluding to, what we're allowed to consume. So, you know, if certain books or certain YouTube videos make us think sad thoughts or make us more depressed and less happy, and less sort of productive members of society, we should limit the exposure to that. We've already seen the language shifting. So things like yeah. digital ketosis is one of those sort of trend terms that we pick up yeah. in our trend research over the last few years and the click clean, like you eat clean. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a national health insurance, again, objective on the, to, to keep a population healthy and happy to actually limit content that does not make people happy and healthy. Even Which is from now a, being written into legal frameworks. It's not even just kind yeah. of censorship by sort of coercion. It's, sense, it's, it's censoring people's thoughts um, through literally through the legal framework now with, you know, bills that are passing through with the Scottish Parliament or the UK Parliament is, you know, really quite frightening. Yeah, I mean, we see the censorship bills were pretty much a 2020 trend. They weren't Global necessarily trend, it's called <laughs> 2020. They weren't called censorship bills, but most of them were relating Basically. to the sorts of things we were allowed to say and not say. So they were effectively sort of censorship bills. Mm -hmm. It was quite a big rash of them. I'm sure that's going to continue for reasons of harm. Again, the greater good, right? Yeah. Which aren't <laughs> defined, which aren't defined in those bills. So like the online safety bill, which originally was called the online harms bill, harms aren't actually defined, of course, because you can't, because the premise on it's which personal. all of this is set is that <laughs> it's subjective. And if you feel that what you have been harmed, then you have been harmed. So by, <laughs> I mean, by definition, you can't define it, which is really very dodgy territory indeed. But that's a fascinating point, tying back into how we open the conversation around the individual versus the, the me versus the we, because what we're essentially trying to do is to regulate individual subjective feelings with objective one-size-fits-all laws, which is a really fascinating point. So the one, on the one hand, we're asking people to be more the same, but on the other hand, we are encouraging certain forms of individuality but it's almost a sort of form of individuality that doesn't allow you to act as an individual which is a really fascinating philosophical yeah. idea of how those those forces are played off against each other yeah I don't know what I mean one could think about it we used to have customs and norms and sort of community values and of course we had religion which would um, give us guidance on morality as all of that's been destroyed and dispensed with, then in comes the lawyer, you know, with their with their legal framework. And that's why it feels so restrictive and so 
one size fits all in the same way that vaccinations actually are one size fits all. So maybe, you know, we're going to get to, you know, trust the law because we've been told to trust the science. It's literally whatever is politically convenient. And, and that becomes, you know, the consensus that we need to all conform to. Um, you know, so you're right. But, you know, when you have customs um, and that are community based in a small community that feel very local, then there are, you know, there's there's a way of behaving which is kind of um, more organic. And if you go too extreme, it kind of gets pulled back and it kind of does work, work in this way. I'm not sure it can work on a, on a bigger scale, but people kind of know that. And once you once you once you're not in that small at a human level kind of scale, then obviously there's a there's an argument to have a sort of legal framework. But yes, to go back to the original bit of the, the conversation, it is just it is literally just flattening us out legally, not just digitally, but legally. Trust the political science ties it all up together, right? Yeah. Trust the science. Exactly. Trust, <laughs> trust, trust the pseudo science. <laughs> trust, trust the people in charge. But I suppose you can look at this very Always. cynically, but you can also you can also look at it from a try try to be less cynical, which is hard for people like me and perhaps people like you to do. <laughs> but you could look at it from a from a point of view that's that's in general, most of us want to be healthy and happy and that, you know, we can't really begrudge those who are trying to sort of regulate us into health and happiness if they can make it for us. But I think that really begs the question of if health and happiness can be imposed upon us through even benevolent sort of lawmakers and caretakers, or if it is something that we can only ever really do ourselves as individuals. I think that sort of starts treading quite quickly into very philosophical waters. It asks us to ask questions as to whether we even are individuals or not, or if we live in a sort of universe where we all actually are one being that's trying to make its way back to itself. You know, these are very deep philosophical ideas, because if we are all connected, if the universe is one, then when we are tending towards some sort of a political science singularity would make perfect sense, even from an ethical point of view. Mm -hmm. If, however, we are actually individuals and that free will does exist, that's a complete nightmare. That's not a utopian ideal at all. And those are not questions that we have answers to. So it becomes very, very difficult to argue against any sort of policy that's trying to lead us towards a joyous singularity, which I think a lot of people in the future space, particularly coming from the transhumanist sort of corners of our, our kind of industry, do see things in that way. They see singularity as being a positive goal to work towards and not as something that's actually a, a horrific nightmare. And I think it that's why I was interested in what you're saying about religion again, is that religions tend to, many of the sort of religions that have defined our sort of weird Western society were based on the idea that we are individuals and that we do have free will. That as that idea breaks down, there's really no counterbalance towards trends and policies and idea makers who would rather have us pursue a holistic we based goal how do you argue against that i'm not sure that you uh, can yeah i used to feel i suppose more critical of religion than i am now because what i've realized is in a way the entity that judges you it's better for that entity to be outside the system if you like once that the judger is in the system um, it doesn't really work. Um, and I think that's partly what we're seeing now. It's kind of interesting to me, actually, when I look at lots of the people who are, I suppose you would, um, I suppose you would um, say they're very progressive, or you could say that the most extreme are kind of like towards this wokeism, or whatever you want to call it. Um, they're, they're the people that used to work in the industries, like fashion, like lots of these other industries that have always judged people. And now there's kind of like this new ways to judge people. And rather than judging them on their on their physicality or their wardrobe or their, you know, output, you can judge them on their on their morality or not. And I suppose I, I always I kind of that's made me realize that actually it's the job of the judgment has to be outside beyond what we could possibly know. We have to have a faith in that. 
um, rather than the, the judges being too in your face and very human because it's just not going to work. It's interesting when I was researching the book and I spoke to Audrey Tang, it also made me realise that, and actually when I was talking to some of the kind of um, trends people in China, it made me realise how much in the past we have kind of trusted our neighbours, our citizens, the other nodes in the we network, if you like. Um, what's happened now is that accidentally or intentionally, we we don't trust each other now. And of course, when one doesn't trust one's compatriots and neighbours and affiliates, um, who, who can one trust and one looks to the state? And that feels to me like that's another kind of loss of individual individuality and identity certainly in the UK I think we used to trust each other and over time we're being programmed not to trust each other and to only trust an authority um, in this case perhaps the state or the medical institutions or whatever but at the same time we can see those institutions breaking down so who can one trust at the moment and that's the problem pe people are in and there's a whole generation growing up who feel like the only thing they can trust then if they don't have religion is technology and that's why you get to a situation where potentially the singularity could play a role there and could be beneficial or potentially it couldn't you put too much trust in it it won't be if you put enough trust in it and maybe it'll turn out quite well but putting all of your trust in it it's not going to turn out well at all right yeah i mean that's exactly it you got two choices a control-based society or a trust-based society yeah. and where we go wrong with trying to replace trust in people with trust in machines, the trust is fundamentally a peer-to-peer -peer activity. It's a one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. You don't trust exactly. a system. You trust an individual. You trust an experiment. You don't trust the science. You know, there's a, there's a difference there. And I think that so many people working in this space with very, very good intentions, particularly those in the sort of decentralized blockchain economy, are trying to build trustless systems, which I think sounds great to start off with, because you're like, how do you replace trust in untrustworthy human beings, but without developing a control-based society? You know, let's, let's build a society that doesn't require trust at all. But what we end up doing then is, is further breaking down trust, right? So you kind of have to trust in the trustless system, which is it becomes quite ironic quite quickly. The, the only way to build a trust-based society is on an individual basis. And control, conversely, requires, you know, flattening those individuals altogether into, a, into uh, commodities that can be managed. Are they saying it's a trustless system or are they saying trust is embedded in every single node of the, of the system? So are they saying it's trust-free or are they saying it's trust everywhere? You know, that that. Uh, that's the that, difference. It depends on who you ask in these various different systems. But I know in the early days, the, the sort of mantra was decentralize all the things and build trustless systems, systems that don't require mm -hmm. trust in any one particular point. And that's critical because a decentralized system is there's no single point of failure. There's no single point that you have to trust. And that's what centralized authorities are, a single entity that you must trust. Even in a control-based system, it still sort of requires you to sort of trust in that one system rather than everyone else. So the, the trustless system on its face sounds quite a lot like, you know, trusting everyone. But actually, when you interrogate it, it means trust no one. Mm. Trust only the consensus. Again, and the consensus yeah, yeah. in a decentralized system, again, it, it can be quite quickly sort of combined with the ideas of things like the singularity and all the rest of it, which is very interesting how coming from very different parts, we end up with very different systems, both of which, whether you're talking about decentralized or centralized based tech systems, cut individual relationships really out of the system altogether. Yeah. Well, the thing is, it's like this in everything. It can't be a binary. Is it like this or is it like that? Is it all the individual or is it the collective? Is it the trustless or the trustness, you know, it can't be that. It's always got to be about finding the right balance. It's the same reason, like, intelligence doesn't reside anywhere. The definition of intelligence being together in between, you know, it has to be an in betweenness. And I think what I'm sort of saying, particularly in the book, is that our identity, it's not that it should all be about the individual and their expression lived in this sort of libit through this libertarian lens. It's it, but equally, it shouldn't be this dystopian collective where everybody thinks they are behaving in a way to benefit everybody else, but tragically, then they're kind of not. Um, and it has to be, we have to find this right balance. And I suppose that's um, 
<clears throat> that would be the hope really. And it's not like it's a balance that stays steady over time. You're constantly dialing it up and down and if, if one can. And I think that's what we're, you know, it's the graphic equalizer of, you know, identity. And we're trying to find our way and maneuver and navigate through it. I just feel like at the moment, the narrative is swung way over to the sort of, well, I was looking at even a conference that I'm looking at going to through <laughs> about the future, you know, is like the shift from, from me to we, and I'm like, oh God, does it, you know, there again it is, you know, I was really looking forward to that um, event, but now I'm not because I feel like it's all going to swing to one extreme. I suppose one can understand it if we feel like the last 20 years have been too much focus on the individual. I'd argue it hasn't been, but it has potentially been seen through the lens of the consumerist sort of individual. Um, but again, I think it's just about finding this balance. Um, and then somehow sort of steadying the ship somehow. Yeah, I mean, the irony of thinking that your sort of big capitalist company is like a Facebook, for example, is about the me and not about the we, which is, is quite hilarious. <laughs> I just had to, I just had to say that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very ironic. It's very ironic right there. But I think that's probably a good point to sort of wrap this up. I think we've scared people enough. Shame. Sorry if these ideas are new to you. <laughs> But they were thinking about, and I think that's exactly right that you're saying it's not either or, it's definitely got to be an end when it comes to both individuals and society. Conflict is good in a system. A society that's entirely homogenous is not a very stable society, quite ironically, again. You know, evolutionary speaking, you need that balance between cooperation and conflict in order for any society to both grow and survive. And you don't get conflict in a very, very homogenous society at all so there's definitely room for both and there, there needs to be balance and unfortunately when the balance tilts too far in one direction it tends to pull back exactly. a bit too much in the other which is probably why we're dealing with a lot of these sort of questions at the moment but I think that's why we have parents though you know that's why we have parents because the child feels like it's all I and then you know the community feels like it's we and suddenly we have and we have some parents to potentially navigate us and help us balance those sorts of things and um you know we we have to think that we're like got to parent ourselves in some ways and parent others and the next generation to try and help navigate uh, us through uh, us through this so we don't end up in um uh, a collective imagination sort of utopia which we know doesn't exist but a collective utopia that you know isn't isn't what we thought we were going to get and actually we can't escape from yeah a bit of a bit of individual identity is a good thing too much of it can also lead to chaos i think we know that too depending mm -hmm. on how you want to look at things but i think balance is, is definitely where it's at so to close off with tracy if there were any threads you want to connect there or points you want to clarify this is your opportunity otherwise let people know where they can find you or your avatar if you would like to be found by people that stumble yeah, across the show exactly i'm not going to tell you my pseudonymous um identity because then you'll know what i really think no um you can find me at, on twitter at tracy futures um or um i do write a bit of a blog on identity and the some of the issues we've been talking about at um, www.tracyfoys.com or you can find me at future made consulting where i do like more serious stuff that i try to get paid for <laughs> and bring it back down to the to the stakeholder capitalists again right <laughs> of course <laughs> Everyone's got to earn a living. We do still live in a in a capitalist individualist society for now. Be practical. Gotta <laughs> be practical. Thank you so much, Tracy. This has been great fun. Thanks, Brenda.